your hosts have earned a reputation as fierce and effective advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Both partners are experienced trial attorneys who have been board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Thanks for tuning in to the For Better, Worse, or Divorce podcast, where we provide you tips and insights on how to navigate divorce and child custody situations in the state of Texas. I'm Brian Walters, and here today I'm joined by Karina Karina Rampo to discuss busting and enforcing prenups and postnups. Welcome, Karina. We're happy to have you join us. Um, Let's start by telling uh, us a little bit about yourself. You know, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to high school, college, law school? How'd you end up in family law and that, all that kind of stuff? Sure. Well, first of all, I just wanted to start out by saying thank you for having me. It's an honor sure. to be here. And a little bit about me. I grew up in Dallas, Plano area. I've been in Texas for all of my life. Um, I went to Texas A&M University for, the, for my undergrad. And interestingly, that's actually where I first started working at a family law firm. My junior year of college, I started working for a small firm and it just happened to be a family law firm. And with slight deviations after law school, I've pretty much stayed on the family law track the entire time. So after I graduated from Texas A&M, I ended up back in Dallas at SMU for law school, graduated in 2019, passed the bar in 2019. Great. Well, um, I'm also an A&M under, um, undergrad graduate, a few, quite a long time before you. Um, you definitely had better uh, work than I did. I was My uh, job when I was at uh, A&M, I was a subway sandwich delivery boy. <laughs> so not exactly preparing me for the, the job I'm in now. So congratulations on you on getting a jump on it. So, um, and I suspect the family law world was different there in, a, in kind of a college town than it would be in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, probably a lot of, a lot of different situations. I actually was passing through college station on Friday, bizarrely, um, at a deposition kind of northwest of there and and I had to stop there for like coffee or whatever but it was uh hadn't been back in a while it was it was interesting to see the old town so yeah and it's I mean it's changed quite a bit even since I've been there so definitely all right well let's get on to our topic so we're talking about pre, what are called pre and post nups um technically they're called marital property agreements or, or other fancy terms but basically they're contracts between to two people either before they get married or it could even be in the middle of the marriage. They could do it. So prenup is pre or prior to the marriage and a postnup is after the marriage. Um, actually, sometimes people do both, but uh, generally it's one or the other. Um, so I think there's there's always a question I always get is, is this going to hold up? Right. If, if someone comes to me and says draft one, because, you know, why? Why go through it if it's not going to be enforceable? So. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the enforceability of these and the, the kind of things that uh, might make them enforceable or unenforceable? Sure. And I mean, that's the million dollar question. And sometimes it is literally a million dollar question. Or more. Or more. And, you know, if you're the person that wants a prenup to be enforced, there are a lot of things you need to do before that prenup is even signed. And you need to do them the right way and with the right timing. Um, The two main questions, which is a much deeper analysis than this, but the two questions that are kind of asked are, was the premarital agreement signed voluntarily? And that's typically a fact question. And that's where you get into all the circumstances surrounding the signing of the agreement and, you know, before the wedding, typically. And then the second question is kind of whether that agreement was unconscionable. Unconscionable is typically a legal analysis. And... Oftentimes, when people are making an argument about one or the other, those get blended. And courts don't always necessarily separate the two. Um, but really, voluntariness is a fact question, and unconscionability is a legal question. And within that, you know, every person's situation before a prenuptial agreement is signed or a premarital agreement is signed is different. And then, and then you get into really the gritty of it, which I'm sure we'll get into here with a few more. Uh, discussion points. So let's talk about that. I mean, let's talk about the two parts of it, voluntary um, versus not. Now, you, know, you always have the extreme of, you know, whatever the saying is from the Godfather, you know, you sign, sign that either your signature is going to be on the 
contract or your brains are, you know, with someone having a gun to their head. That's clearly not voluntary. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. Um, it's usually, in fact, I doubt it would ever be that uh, that dramatic. Um, on the other hand, we're all adult. I mean, anybody who signs one of these is an adult. Um, you know, you might or might not want to sign it um, because it, you know, whatever reason. But where do we, where is the kind of the gray area in that where, you know, there's not a, you know, formal threat or something to your health or life, but it's maybe somebody's not really that excited about signing it. Where, where do we kind of draw the line between those voluntary and not voluntary? Yeah. And, you know, that can depend, but some of the situations that I've come across are closeness in time to the wedding, right? So if the wedding's the next day, although there is case law that shows prenups have been upheld when they've been signed the day before the wedding, the two cases where recently prenups that we handled were not upheld, um, they looked very closely at timing before the wedding. I think one was four days, one was about a week before the wedding. And they took that as a situation where this person was under too much pressure and they did not either sign this voluntarily or there was some duress involved with that consideration. Other cases look at when there's a wife signing a premarital agreement that a husband once signed, that wife was pregnant. Um, pregnancy can also influence that. Um, and those are, I mean, timing is the biggest thing. And just from a practical standpoint and a practice tip standpoint, if you are a person who wants a prenup to be signed, you need to be kind of laying down the groundwork for that long before the wedding. You need to talk to a lawyer. You need to be a planner. It, even though they can be upheld, you don't want to take that chance. If there's assets in property that you're trying to protect, you might as well just get this done in advance. It's, it's just like going to the courthouse and getting your marriage license. You know, these are all things that need to be pre-planned, predetermined. If you don't want to run the risk, why take that chance, right? That a court could say, well, this prenup is invalid because it was signed a week before the wedding. Yeah. And I mean, this isn't all law stuff, just practical stuff. But I mean, if you're thinking of getting engaged to somebody, probably should have that discussion. Like, hey, I want you, I'm going to want you to sign a prenup that says, you know, basically that. And I think you should probably talk about the basic terms, right? Like that basically says our finances will always be separate, something along those lines. And if the other person says, fine, no problem, um, you know, then you should you can go ahead and get engaged. And and then you're right. Let's, uh, you know, get get them the draft. And, and this is a multi-part step, right? So you're you're talking about, let's say your goal is you'd like to have it to to get it signed 60 days before the wedding, which is probably assuming there are no other factors, a good chunk, a good chunk of time. Because by the way, you don't want to do it too far in advance because the one of the things you have to do is list the assets and debts that either party has. Usually you have to do that. Um, and that might change, right? If you signed a prenup two years before you got married and then there was a big financial change, then it wouldn't be accurate anymore at the time of uh, the actual marriage, which could be an issue. Um so I think you'd probably, you know, you're going to have to find a lawyer to draft this. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. They're going to have to draft it. It's going to take some time. Uh, you're going to um, want the other side to be able to review it, probably with the lawyer, which means they're going to have to find a lawyer and have it reviewed. And then there may be some revisions and back and forth. I mean, you should probably, you know, most people's engagements last a year or longer these days. And so you should probably, maybe a year out, you should be, Having that drafted up, um, certainly six to nine months out, I think would be smart to do. And I think when you communicate to the other side, I think you ought to be real clear and, and stick with it and just say, okay, let's say you're six months out, you give them a prenup and you just basically say, look, if we don't have this signed within two months, so that's four months out, um, we're going to call off the wedding. And um, I think that's probably reasonable. And uh, But you, know, you don't want to have it going back and forth up till right before. I mean, we were hired this past week on a case on Tuesday afternoon that they were going to get married on Thursday. And um, suffice it to say, neither one of those things happened. Every <laughs> time did not get signed and the marriage did not happen because that's just crazy, right? I mean, there's just no way you can do that. And that was a real complicated set of properties and debts and things. And so there, that would have been, even if we had managed to get it done, um, and the other side signed it, you're, you're absolutely right. Somebody would have been right back in court if they ever split up to challenge it and say, this was tossed on me at the last second. So yeah, I totally, totally agree. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes into the, 
age old adage of if you're going to do something, do it right. And that applies to a prenuptial agreement. I mean, once you get into like kind of a week, a few days before a wedding, you've got vendors, you've got guests flying in, you've got all these things that could play into eventually flipping that. Because think about it. If you're going to court on a prenuptial agreement, someone's going to want that to stand up and someone's going to want that destroyed. And there's probably facts that support both sides of that. But unfortunately or fortunately, depending on what side you're on, this is a this can be a very fact-heavy analysis. And then you're putting it in the hands of a judge who may, one judge may feel a certain way about it being assigned a week before the wedding. A different judge might feel a different way about it. So, yeah, exactly. So, um, all right, well, let's talk about, uh, you mentioned judge, um, can these, can this question of the voluntariness be decided by a judge or a jury? How, or, or is it your choice? I believe it can be a, the choice of a person. I think it is too. I mean, it's a fact. It's a fact question, like you said, and that's it's not a question of law. It's a question of fact. So that sounds like a jury thing. So, you know, you might think about that. And and if you're you're going to get a sense of in a lot of counties, the bigger counties, you don't know which judge you're going to get till you file something to challenge it, for example. But then you'll know, and then you may get a sense in some of the preliminary hearings about, or maybe the judge's history. In, in the uh, likelihood or not that it would be that the judge would be sympathetic to your your side, whichever side it is. So then if it's if you think you're going to not get a fair hearing from this particular judge, you have a right to a jury and um, you should probably exercise that. I've got one of those going exactly exactly that we had on, on Thursday. We got it a, you know, assigned to, to trial and we're going to have a trial on on those things on the voluntariness is exactly the the issue. And Brian, if I may interject here, that that brings up a very interesting point, too, because I think we as lawyers, you know, we may draft premarital agreements and that's something we would want to advise our clients on accordingly. But we also may be given a set of facts that we were not the attorneys when this prenup was drafted. Right. We are looking at an agreement that was done by an attorney, hopefully. um, And we're being given a set of facts that we did not necessarily have control over, but we have to be prepared to argue those facts either to bust the prenup, as they say, or uphold it. And when you get into anything that's a fact-heavy analysis, then you also have to think about the people who were involved at the time. I mean, we've had prenups where the lawyer who drafted the prenup is no longer living or practicing, and they may not be able to testify. You may have had witnesses at the wedding who can talk about the person who signed the premarital agreement the day before the wedding, who could talk about their mental state, that witness may not be available. All of those things are in play. And that just goes back to, if you're going to do it, do it the right way. Absolutely agree. Okay. So this unconscionability. um, So, I mean, again, the extreme, first of all, the purpose of getting a prenup is you want it to be in your favor, right? If you're, let's say you're the high wage earner or you have a lot of assets you may want to bring up to protect that in case your marriage doesn't work out. That's, you know, you are trying to gain an advantage to for yourself at the to the detriment of the person you're about to marry. Um, so that's, you know, I, that's allowed, right? I mean, you're allowed to act in your own best interest in that situation. You're not married yet. You don't have a, a legal duty to the other side, at least with the prenup. Um, so for unconscionability, I mean, let, let's use the example that I, I gave, which is a common type of prenup, which is to say, um, you know, I get everything, you know, whatever I come in with, I leave with and whatever you come in with, you leave with and whatever I earn, I keep and whatever you earn, you keep. Um, when, um, you know, what would be an example or some examples of something that might be unconscionable, if you can think of any? You know, um, unconscionability is can be a complicated question. Um, Oftentimes, maybe there's something that the prenup disposes of, but that wasn't necessarily properly disclosed, Um, like a lake house or something that maybe the spouse who wants the prenup to go away or to be dissolved didn't even know about. And That's why, you know, if you're going to do a prenuptial agreement that covers everything, because you can also do a prenuptial agreement that just says, all right, this isn't disposing of everything. The courts can dispose of this stuff later, but I keep my income. She keeps hers. Right. You can do that. But if if it is meant to be a prenup that disposes of all the property or predisposes of all the property. 
the, you need to disclose everything. And because if you don't, and if this becomes a court case or it becomes an issue in the future, you're going to have to disclose it anyways, whether it's part of the divorce or potentially part of the premarital agreement discussion, if it's getting into an assessment of unconscionability. So, um, you know, the biggest, the best example I can give you is either an asset or a bank account or some sort of money that one spouse didn't know about. Um, and that's just where disclosure comes in and be honest about it now because you're going to have to be honest about it later. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a disclosure part. And, and there's two options under the law. You can either, you either need to disclose, I'm not going to say everything, but I mean, you probably don't have to list every piece of pottery that you have or every piece of cloth or something, but generally the bigger items or you can opt to, if you both agree, it, it will at least on its face stand is to say, well, we've just waived disclosing it. To me, that seems like a bad idea to waive the disclosure I, for exactly the reason you just talked about. Um, and you could imagine some other scenarios that might be an issue. Let's say you knew you were going to get a really large inheritance and um, you, know, you didn't necessarily disclose that because at the time of the prenup, you... Um, it, you hadn't happened yet, right? That that might, in hindsight, be a significant issue. Um, you might, in that case, want to disclose it as I think I'm going to get a you know large inheritance in the next twelve months or something like that. And that just to put that in there to be safe. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it's a harder argument to make about the unconscionability um, than the voluntariness because again, you're you're seeking an advantage, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. So. Just because you know you seek a, as long as you fully disclose it, then I think you will not have so many of those problems. Um, okay, anything else you'd want to add about this? I mean, it does sound like it's something you know we litigate and we draft these things, so something we're pretty familiar with. I, I personally am. I mentioned this before we started, but I personally am seeing a large increase in the number of prenups and postnups that I'm being asked to draft, um, which. I think it's sort of like drafting wills. <laughs> um, there's a lag, right? Um, until some some event happens to trigger it. So maybe 10 or 20 years from now, I'm going to get a you know corresponding number of these people come back in my office to say, well, it didn't work out. And now they're trying to bust the prenup you draft, drafted for me. And then we'll be you know off to court to uphold it or, or vice versa. Um, anything else come to mind with, with you? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is like use modern day technology to like strengthen your prenup agreement. You can videotape, you can record the signing of it. And I mean, a good, a well-drafted prenup should say on the paper, like, you know, I understand what I'm signing. I fully understand what I'm signing. I've had counsel advise me on this, but why not take that extra step? Almost like it's a deposition or a court proceeding because one day it might come in to, to be that. And there might not be people available 20 years later to talk about it. So why not videotape it? Why not document as much as possible? And that's just, you know, one of the things I learned in school coming out of school fairly recently is use technology to your advantage. Talk to your client about it. See if they want to videotape it. See if they want to record it. Why leave that to chance? I agree. We should talk about pro -nup, pro post um before we switch over to some answering some uh, listener questions. Um, just again, post up is essentially the same concept, except that you're married already. So, um, you know, you've got the same test, um, you know, is it voluntary? So, you know, good examples of, let's say you've been married 10 years and you, you know, suddenly say to your wife, look, I want to get a post up that very much changes the way we're going to do things. If we ever split up, you know, is it voluntary? Is there some event um, that's occurred that, that makes somebody more or less likely to sign it? Um, are you threatening to divorce them if they don't sign it? Um, is there, you know, another kid on the way, like you said, um, or something along those lines? So I think those would uh, probably be probably be the same thing. And I think in that one, you might get into more of an unconscionability argument if you've got just a regular kind of standard agreement that, that follows Texas law. Um, and suddenly you're asking your wife to give up all of her rights to all the property and hand it over to you. I think that's going to be a harder argument to make that that's conscionable than if it was a prenup. That that seems like it to me. Any any thoughts on postnups? Yeah, I had a really good law professor who said it's easier to agree with someone when you're in love with them than when you're no longer in love with them. And so, you know, I'm obviously pro prenup because you're there, there's more leverage there from that standpoint. Because it's either you like I'm 
not going to marry you if this doesn't go through, right? Um, and there's advantages to that. Now, obviously, people's financial landscapes change sometimes after marriage, sometimes very shortly after a marriage. And as long as that's still, you know, a healthy relationship and you're not doing it necessarily thinking, oh, I want to get divorced in the year. Let's get a pre post up signed, you know, um, that's still a conversation that can be had. There may be additional property that you guys want to figure out how that's disposed of now rather than figure it out when you're not agreeing with someone, aka when you're divorcing someone and you're mad and there's other factors like emotion in play. So I think the biggest thing with a post up is it certainly can be done, but once again, it needs to be done the right way. You probably want to use the same attorneys if you were happy with those attorneys and follow the same kind of steps in that process of doing it the right way. I, there's no problem with it. It's harder to do. Your leverage is gone. You're already married, but it certainly can be done. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Well, th there's some um, listener questions um, that we have, so we'll kind of go through those. And they're some of them we've already covered, so I've taken some of them out, but there's some others that aren't. And it jumps around a little bit from topic to topic. So um, I'm going to start um, with the question of um, what happens if I get a prenup in Texas and I and get married in Texas and then I move to New, we move to New York um, and we get divorced up there. Is it valid? The answer is it should be. Um, there's a uniform, basically, marital agreement or prenup or postnup statute that all 50 states have passed that says, you know, if you basically, if you follow these basic steps, um, which we've already talked about those, then they'll be valid elsewhere. Now, what is different is that, the, you know, other states may have, you know, more or less generous alimony statutes or community property or separate property, all that kind of thing. But generally, you would you draft these pretty broadly so they would stand up in other states. Um, so the answer to that is yes. Um, now, if you go to another country, that's a different question. Um, depends on the country, depends on their laws. Um, I have enforced or in, in fought, and fought about enforcing um, out of country prenups in, in the United States and Texas. So that's a different question. Um, but I think within the states, yeah, if it's drafted properly, it should stand up in New York or California or Texas or wherever it is. Um, so, um, all right. So let's let's talk about some of the things. There's several questions about what can be and not be in a in a prenup, that, which is a really interesting concept. So, because it's not everything, um, and, and like you said, it doesn't have to be the things that it can be in there. It could be some or, or none or or just a few of them. So, question: Does um, a prenuptial agreement mean I won't get alimony? What is what? How would you answer that? Uh, it certainly could. <laughs> it's like the classic lawyer answer. It depends, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's let me try to unpack this a little bit more. Um, the general rule with a prenuptial agreement is that it can't go against public policy, right? Um, so that would typically mean something like you cannot have a prenup agreement that uh, gets rid of a person's child support obligation. That is a big no-no. That can't be done. But because alimony or spousal support is something that could involve property, you could have a prenuptial agreement that says, okay, like you only get 2000 a month, not what you could get, or you get none. So, yes, I mean, the answer is yes. But again, it's the right way. Speaking of different states having different outcomes, that's a good example of one, um, you know, where what might look like, you know, let's say you got married in California and you kind of calculated back of the envelope that you might owe your wife if you got divorced, you know, I don't know, 5000 a month in alimony. Well, if you, you, you know, you negotiated that in half and, and said, I'll only pay you 2500 then you move to Texas where you're probably not going to pay her any. Um, now it becomes a bad deal. <laughs> so, um, you know, you just you have to think about those things a little bit. And of course, we don't know sometimes what's going to happen. OK, another question kind of related to it is is sort of the, about the details and drafting is can I include the question is, can I include infidelity in the prenuptial agreement? I, I think that what that specifically means is, can I um, can we put terms in there about that? So if somebody is unfaithful there would be a consequence or a particular you know, thing would happen like, hey, you don't get any alimony if you cheat on me or something like that. Let's use that as an example since we just talked about alimony. Um, is that the kind of thing that, that can be included in a, in a pre or post-nup? Yeah, it's a, a prenuptial agreement is a contract. And mm -hmm. 
I think it could certainly be included, but a court a court may view that one way or another. I think a court some courts could say, oh, this is not an enforceable term or an enforceable clause on this contract. Um, some courts may say, okay, yeah, you built in an infidelity clause in there and this is what it is. And, and I mean, I think it's less of an issue these days, but it but there's a, an issue of you know proving it right now. You got to prove whether it happened or not, and you know what if there was a point in time where someone claimed you know we had an open relationship, and you know you said that was fine, or you know, or you did it first, or whatever. I mean, there there are a lot of different ways. I mean, th- this is actually gets back to an Im- important issue. I think is is I try to make I try to encourage people to when I'm drafting them to make these things simple. Um, the more complicated they get, with you know, if this happens, then here's the consequence, or uh, you know, you've got all these different things. It's really complicated, and um, you're asking yourself to get into litigation about that stuff if it. If, if your marriage comes apart and one of the nice things about a prenup or postnup that's clearly enforceable and well drafted is that you don't need to spend a lot of time with lawyers and money on lawyers fighting about things, at least on money related, because they're clearly answered within this. Um, but then if you start making them very complicated, you get problems. Um, so anyway, so you, short answer is, yeah, you can include provisions about infidelity. I, I usually discourage it though, just because of the complexity issue. Um, so anyway, uh, next question, which is really a common question. And um, I'm I'm glad this person asked it. It's, it's important. Uh, it says my fiance and I plan to have children. Can I include in the premarital agreement um, provisions related to custody and, and child support and child's expenses? Um, And kind of surprisingly, the answer is no, right? We just talked about how this is a contract between adults. You can kind of do what you want to. Well, the difference here is that there's children involved. So children always have to go through a court ordered, a court has to do a best interest of the child analysis, at least in Texas and from what I can tell in every other state. So the court can't take that, right? They can't just say, you know, mom has custody, well, that's why, because it says it in the prenup, because that might not be in the child's best interest. What if mom has become a you know, raging alcoholic who passes out for, you know, if all night and you've got a, a newborn, right? You're not going to put a, a child with the mom in that case. That would be not in the child's best interest. So I wouldn't put it in there. Now, I have seen people put things in there that say, you know, if we ever split up, it's our intention that, you know, this happened or that happened, you know, that we co-parent equally or, you know, that mom has custody or whatever. I mean, you can kind of put your general feelings in there, but it's not enforceable on a court. Maybe you could use it in court to argue, you know, well, this is what we've always said we were going to do is 50-50, but the court's not bound by it. Um, And probably the longer, the further you get away from that document being signed, the less likely a judge is even to consider it if they were going to anyway. And, and the more, the more that happens, right, the less it would make sense. So can include kids, at least not anything binding in there. And because it's not binding, I tell people just, I mean, again, what's the point of putting it in there? It's not going to have any effect. And, you know, it's probably another argument, another thing to argue over with your soon to be spouse um, that for what, you know, for what purpose. So to me, that doesn't make any sense. And I mean, you know, sometimes people people just want that in there to feel better and okay, fine. But I agree with you. I think the simpler, the better, because the more complex something gets, uh, the more you kind of leave that up to interpretation of the fact finder, which could be a judge, could be a jury. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. One more question from um, our listeners. I got this one the other day. I had somebody call me up and and uh, through a, like through another lawyer in LA had rec- had recommended him to him and sent me to him and, and sent him to me and I um, so I, and I just you know we texted him and got on the phone and right before we got on the phone to just to talk about it kind of preliminarily she said oh I'm gonna um, you know merge in my fiance <laughs> I was like wait wait a second uh so let me so let me tell you what the question is so the question is my fiance and I both agree that we want a premarital agreement and we know what we want in it can we use the same lawyer for our premarital agreement no same answer as can we use the same lawyer to do a, our divorce even though we've agreed on everything 
And, you know, that, by the way, that's a really good question. And it makes sense that you could, right? Like, we agree. What's the big deal? Um, you know, we agree on getting divorced. Why can't we save money and just, you know, have one lawyer do everything? Well, the, the answer is, is your is the lawyer themselves has a conflict and can't do it. So I guess you could find an unethical lawyer, but I don't recommend that. Um, so we're not allowed as lawyers um, to represent two people who have their interest in conflict with each other. Now, if somebody came to me and said, look, I want to adopt, I want my new husband to adopt our child. You know, I think I could probably do that for both of them. I probably have the, you know, the soon to be adoptive dad sign something saying, you know, I don't have to do that. I know I don't have to do this and I might have to pay child support, all that other kind of stuff. But generally I could do it. But when you're even if you agree on things, you're still it's sort of like what we said at the beginning. You, you know, your the premarital agreement or the postmarital agreement is to gain an advantage over the person you're about to marry. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. I mean, it just is what it is. But. Um, when that happens, we lawyers can't get because we we have a duty to our client to do what's in their best interest. And so, you know, if somebody if the agreement of these two folks was, you know, the wife's the higher wage earner and she's going to keep all of her money and she's got, you know, this all these assets and the husband's going to just, you know, not earn as much probably or be a stay at home dad. And and uh, he's fine giving all that up. Well, you know, that's in our client's best interest if we represent the wife, but in the husband's, we'd be saying like, you know, dude, you know, that's not, you're really going to regret this someday, I suspect. And um, so we can't be in that position to do it. So, um, and that would, speaking about unenforceable, that would probably on its face be a real problem with, <laughs> with having it be enforced. I would, I would think plus problems for the lawyer that decided to do that. Yeah. And I, I think it just goes to the general sense of if both people have attorneys when a prenup is being signed, I think that helps with the enforceability of it. If you're trying to protect hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of assets, spend the money to get the other spouse an attorney. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, if you have pennies on the dollar, you may never need it. But, you know, you know, if you do, you'll really, really be glad that you did spend that money. And if you don't need it, fine. Yeah, peace of mind and um, and you're good. All right. Well, we've actually gone a little longer than than um, projected, but that's because there's a lot to this topic. And as I said, it's become an increasingly important part of our firm's practice. And so. Um, I suspect that will continue. Um, so we're, we're trying to keep people informed. Um, all right. Well, that's all we have for today. If you like what you've heard today, please do us a favor and leave a review. We appreciate all feedback, especially when it helps us better the podcast. If you have any follow-up questions this episode or would like to talk to one of us directly about your family law situation, reach out to us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com or you can just contact us directly through our website, which is waltersgilbreth.com. I'm Brian Walters here with Karina. Thank you for listening. Thank you. For information about the topics covered in today's episode and more, you can visit our website at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of For Better, Worse, or Divorce, where we post new episodes every first and third Wednesday. Do you have a topic you want discussed or a question for our hosts? Email us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time.